should we uh, ask some questions or should we continue on? What should we do? Well, if you're at a uh, stopping point, I know that there's an overflow of questions and ideas and thoughts, and I'm sure a lot of uh, just praise. Uh, wow, it's already coming through in the, the chats. Um, thank I think you. I had to just take a moment to just say incredible. Thank you. That was an amazing tour. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, and it's uh, I'm letting you off lightly. I know it's, <laughs> it's the uh, it, it does go on and on. I'd love the questions because I think we have a wonderful opportunity to look at them with visuals as well, to, to really uh, look at them with a new layer. So um, yeah, let's just dive in, whatever anybody would like to uh, ask or, you know, uh, why don't we start there? Lee. Excellent, excellent. You know, I've known you for a few years now and it looks to me like the hieroglyph room is still a work in process. You know, Dana, I realized that, you know, because somebody asked me that and I said, I've been working on it for 20 years, but it's called the hieroglyph of the human soul. And if you think about the human soul, that is definitely a work in progress. I imagine, in fact, I hope that I have two deaths in mind. One, I'm just here and I just fade back into the, the painting itself or just particleize and, and, and evaporate into the mirror. But there is this wonderful, very ancient feeling of of uh, dealing with qualities that, that have been so mentoring in a very, very remarkable way. Yeah. Be postmodern, selfie yourself. Oh, I set up oh all right. There we go. How about that? That's so, good. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah. And thank you for the Okay, so I'm trying to lower on that. Yeah, maybe off. Yeah, I think off. I wouldn't off, mind off. if Alex would uh, find a way to put it on a Pod, tripod. That's what I'm going to do right now. Okay, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Go sit beside you because I I can't tell you how impressed I am with Alex's ability to bring this and capture it with an iPhone. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, I, mean, I, I mm. this is this is brilliant. I mean, what what skill, mm -hmm. what imagination and anticipation Alex has and for him to be able to know what it is. And I know you've rehearsed a little bit, but- Only five years. <laughs> but, but the idea of, this is a testament. We, this is really a testament to the technology that we have to bring the outside in and take a, a little thing that you hold in your hand and show the world what a wonderful space and what a wonderful creativity and soul you have, Lee. Well, bless you, Dana. I, I really, it's, it's an exciting time because I, I've realized with the cave painting that this takes us back to our first technology, paint and storytelling, imagination. And then we have this, the, the, the technology side, which again, if used in this way, really becomes this dance of being able to share with those that care about these things, the qualities that allow them to really um, spend time in, in focused ways. And I'm convinced this is the non-linear coherence going on. Like today, what I love about your myth salon is that people of like mind or fast, you know, in a sense, shared inquiry uh, that care about these things can actually uh, talk with one another. And, and that's why I think the room is what it is, is because it was about uh, really uh, a room where for 40 years now, because I realize I've had over 4,000 discussion groups in this home. So that's, that's thousands upon thousands of hours over the 40 years. And I'm convinced now that that's the very quality that triggered this because, I mean, even the acronym of the hieroglyph of the human soul. After 10 years, I said, well, what's, what's the acronym uh, for, for that? And it turns out to be T-H-O-T-H-S, Thoughts Library, or Thoughts Library, which is astounding because it's as if to say that those that have gathered in this circle and those of us that have gathered oh, on the couch okay and honored these things oh like this with each other okay yeah that have honored these things are actually uh, sharing them now in ways that aren't the old uh, way which is first you convince your neighbor he should care about these things as opposed to like Gardner saying well no if we care about them then if we begin by honoring them and don't have an agenda, who knows what might happen. And what I love here is that this is what happened. It was not a conceit. It is, uh, in a way, a process of 
of, of you'd almost say the greatest rebellion now is to love in spite of it all. To just say, if I'm going to die, then I'll devote myself to saying yes rather than yikes. And that's why this is also intimate space, because I think certain questions now, it doesn't matter what others think. It's how do you live with yourself? What do you do with the despair? Well, and you have continued to renew and revitalize. And as many times as I've been in that room with you and many of the wonderful guests that you've had out there, um, it's never the same. No. I mean, it, it's as if the room reinvents itself. It, if you think about, you know, I, I started to realize that that's a really good insight because we are so used to a type of objective reality, meaning that things are just inert or they, they are. But if we think from an atom point of view that paint or pigment is atomic and therefore it is a coagulation of atomic structure. And this is why our ancient sites were not built with moving parts. They were built with the skin of paint in order to magnetize these qualities as an invocation. And I really feel you're right. I, 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 I'm, I'm up here every day working on this all the time and it is always different. And if we think of that as the metaphor and metaphor of the human psyche, you know, it, it is trying to, I, I really believe, help us understand that we are far more remarkable than we think, but we've limited our perception usually to looking into the mirror or looking away, not starting with primary experience, but a type of reflective. Show them the couch a little bit. Oh, you wanna see a couch? <laughs> Alex asked me to show you the couch. Um, now, if, now I, I'm the son of a, a, yeah, of, a, of, a, of a mom who loved to pun. So, and Alex, my dear friend, is an awful punster. No and just, yeah, yeah, no pun left behind. So, so you must understand that. And also we found with alchemy and hieroglyphics that the double entendre, or the pun is, what? Um, are we on? No. We lost your image. Oh. We did? Yeah, yeah. just a second ago. Oh. I thought you did that intentionally. No. There, oh, you, there you are. Oh, we we wanted to evoke a sense of mystery. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that was the in, imp in the machine that happened well, by itself. Yeah, yeah I, you know the gods you... of technology look askance at an old cave painter. They uh, they just uh, take a look. Uh, but but anyway, the couch. Now yes, to understand, I'm working on this when George Bush is working on SOFA, the Status of Forces Agreement in Iraq, and I'm working on SOFA too. Only a different conversation altogether. But Joseph Campbell pops in and goes. Ah, you see brothers ask different questions, but it's not a matter of comparison. It's what, your, what is your part in this story? And so I guess my part was that speaking of sofa, I was to recouch our understanding of things. So as we move into this uh, uh, reversible couch, we'll begin to see that certain questions show us an appearance on one place. And we'll see once again, this relationship as we can see to the ark and that we are on a great journey Every pillow tells us this. So as we move out, then we'll start to take these off. Now, this is where we'll also start to enjoy that the story of life is hidden even in the hieroglyph of the human soul. And uh, if we think of the three trimesters we have, you see the first, second, third trimester. I'm convinced this, because if we look here, can you see Eve? Can you get a picture of her? Is that, is um, that, oh no, okay. She's there. Oh, she's there, all right. <laughs> this is Eve with the chalice, uh, the, the light of mine, the delight of mine. So she's, can you see her? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so here we have Eve. Now she's a light pillar, and I didn't expect her to show up, but when she did, she told me the story of Adam reborn and Eve restored a romance in two parts. My third book, please look it up. Um, and, but on the light, she started to tell a story of, the, again, the flower, the blossoming that is life, that the chalice is, is really the story of the womb. And that as male and female come together, it's not either or, it's beauty. And on the journey of beauty, she will take us into the couch and she'll begin to show us, because what happens here, and we'll get these lights off of the other pillows, because you might think this is all, but no, it's not all. We have more <laughs> to reveal. Um, and 
we will see this. Do you have enough light on that? Yeah. Okay. Um, and now for something completely different. Um, here, we'll once again see this reoccurring motif of that the qualities of what we think of as the masculine are actually with the umbilical severing create conditions of separation and therefore we create systems in order to reconnect. On the left, we will see the story of the apple, the gift of life and the feminine, the vision of the eternal within the gift of life. Now, once again, we are composed of both of these qualities. And so therefore, as we see this, we will look at this reoccurring motif, again, of the chalice of birth and the life, and that we through birth are taking a journey through her, you can see her on the table, up into the Phoenix Arise. So there's actually a, a moving picture going on, but it's stationary. And after we've recouched our understanding, we put her back together and ask a question that maybe is so far so good. Oh, I can't believe I said that. All right. So, so awesome. That was for my mom. <laughs> All right. Okay. There we go. And of course, that's that's not the end of it, because my question was, well, what about the places that one can't see? And therefore, as we look, I'll say, I want to pull around here. I'll pull out the couch. This is, we'll just show this a little briefly. <sighs> yeah. There we have. So we can see what's under the couch. The eye of the eternal. <laughs> Keeping an eye on things. All right, let's sit back down, and I think that's enough. Let's just uh, let's just talk amongst ourselves. Well, All I right. did want to ask you a question. Uh, part of what you're talking about, the social connections, the puns, it reminds me. You know, part of what's so unique about what you're doing compared to our other is academics and mythologists, depth psychologists. Uh, one of the things we like to do is make comparisons. This is like this. Yes. And having a conversation with our friend Christophe Lemuel, who's a, a director over at the Jung Institute of LA, some of y'all know, and we were talking about that, and this is something I do a lot, I make a lot of comparisons and connections, and he said, as long as you're making comparisons, they're impotent. They have to come together in the unconscious, in dreams, in art, otherwise the connections and the compare, otherwise the comparisons just remain comparisons, and they remain kind of dead, and yeah. so I you know, one, you know, appreciate that you're bringing a lot of the stuff we talk about comparisons and connections we might abstract amongst ourselves sometimes into a real uh, visual expression of how they come together. And I'm wondering if that means anything to you, what, what Christoph was trying to express. Yeah, I, I actually, I think that's a really good point. And uh, part of the key, would you speak of, is coherence. How do we take random notes and essentially see the signature that allows for a type of passage, a type of, of musicality. And I think that one of the great things in this environment is because it's self-instructive, is that the body feels its relationship to these different associations and they don't have to be explained. And I rather feel that that's the truth about most of this. It doesn't really need to be explained. It's much more as a storyteller to try and create a permission, meaning, well, let's, what if we looked at it this way? Because I do think that if we think about comparison, oftentimes it's comparison and unfortunately it becomes a binary because it's comparison uh, not on analogy and correspondence, but more in terms of critique and unique difference. What is fascinating for me are in a way, and this is what I said about the heron, is where I see a reoccurring motif and I realize that although it's the same image, being used in a different context in a different part of the room, it takes on a different significance, which would, is fascinating. I would correlate that with uh, Jung's insight into the difference between signs and symbols. Mm. And and since we're reading Schwala de Lubitsch right now in, in, in the group, that this has a hermetic Egyptian um, initiatory meaning to it, uh, and it connects with Jung's idea by the virtue of their organic birth from the unconscious yeah what you see here are symbols they're not signs mm -hmm. and i've witnessed uh lee painting i swear to you he has no idea what he's doing no it's, it, he can it, yeah, talk yeah. at the same time his yeah. hand just keeps going 
it's it and, and not look at what he's doing yeah they emerge spontaneous. yeah they really do yeah they do i mean you have great technique too but they emerge but i i feel like that's what one of the missing keys i think to a lot of our disciplines is that and what i love about alex being a polymath and i say i am to a, to a great degree is that that there's a type of synesthesia and and because we live in a type of eye ears nose and throat world meaning what's your specialty oftentimes there's a type of disincentive toward a type of creative resolution where it's not trying to arrive at a conclusion but much more at a type of i would almost say a type of like like an improvisation class where you're creating the conditions and you turn it back over to the individual and you say ah now where do you take it and that's what i love about this room because and the cave painting element is it doesn't insist it it lives in an absolute state of, of suggestion and i feel like that's maybe what alex is saying that for me over the years and i think it's my actor side taught me how to get out of the way of of a character and this helped me with the archetypes because there a lot of these energies you could quite literally be run away with or they could run away with you but this ability to not overly personally identify like if i played a killer i wasn't going to be a killer but i had every feeling of, because i gave myself permission to know what that is so my psychology essentially in a safe space this is why i love the theater and why i love discussion within this room because it allows us to uh explore these things without having to believe them and therefore we're able to really honor them uh and 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 see where they take us really a truly inspirational field reading uh you were here when sono shandasani was here dana reading jung in this book is quite in this room it's quite interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, because you 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 can do the equivalent of active imagination without the imagination. All you have to do is look up from the page anywhere. Yeah, yeah. And the associations will flow. And, and maybe that's the key is maybe we are uh, really a, a group of individuals that are finding each other a, a bit like, uh, you know, musicians where they start to realize, well, not everyone's interested in that, but we are. And we have certain traits of listening and trying to really lean into the the story, because I'm convinced now that it's not uh, the war or anything that changes the world. It's much more about story, about how we tell our story. And what I love about this room and people like Alex and those that come here is that it allows us to uh, revivify our sense of wonder, of possibility in a world that continually says these things do not matter. And maybe that's where we're getting to see ourselves as custodians in a polymath way, meaning that I, I see that my contribution and others' contributions, that we're all holding, Alex, all of us are holding different pieces of a great treasure map, that as we come together in intimate space, not to convince those that don't care, but to actually honor those that do, we start to, speaking of coherence, create a different coherence that uh, gathers rather than seeks to, to, to take. And that's, to me, this shifting from what we think of as the masculine, I must convince, to the feminine, I, I must, I must honor, and and something in that uh, is is what's shifting, I think, in a lot of us. I like to hope so. Hi, Lee, May, oh, oh no, please go, go ahead. ahead. So, uh, Lee and Alex, uh, just a, just such a powerful presentation. It's it's just enormous, and I'm glad you brought up Leonardo because. One of the best things that I've read in the last couple of years was Walter Isaacson's um, book on Leonardo. And one of the motifs that runs throughout is Leonardo's ferocious Ill uh, ability to see analogies <clears throat> yes. where the rest of us would just see maybe disparate, um, uh, disparate items in nature and then in culture. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought Leonardo up early on. Yeah, yeah. I'm, fa I'm yeah. fascinated, uh, Lee, with the creative process itself. And I, yeah. I can tell that you are uh, as well from Absolutely. the number yeah. of things that you've said. So I have three questions. One, and um, Dana touched on this already, but I want to reformat it just a little bit. Okay. Did you... Um, did you ap in any way apprehend what you have created in its entirety 
in its totality at any point, or, and I don't mean to make it an either or, but I'm just getting a couple of things out on the table. Right, right, right. Or did it unfold slowly uh, over time? That's one. Mm -hmm. um, second, and I think you've answered it, but I want to uh, say it again. Is it is it done? Are you evolving or are you evolving all of your images, some of your images, even now? Oh, and yeah. three, are you still learning what it is that you've created? Those are great questions. And, and yes, I am still learning. It will never be uh, completed. And it has been a slow reveal. I, I, one of the great gifts I, I've, I've been given this year of turning 65 is there's something shifts in you and you begin to really honor much more of the, the overview of the greater story because for so many years I've, I've, I've been in a way almost like, like dragged by my ear. There's been no like, oh, do you, you know, how do you feel? It's more like I have to do this. But what's been really brilliant, and I, I haven't had time, but, but maybe you can look at my Codex Tor, my book, my books that uh, I, I spent about 25 years on, really uh, exploring the nature of, of consciousness and asking questions about consciousness with a brush and pen. Now, many of the images, like this room itself, came from a place that, that were well beyond my un understanding, but they led to a type of understanding. <laughs> and a deeper type of trust. It's only in the last uh, few years, really, that the coherence of this entire story has made sense. Like, I wondered wow. why downstairs I, I spent 17 years on the tarot, and I realized that the work on the archetype for me, and because my work was not based on other drawings, but the, the dynamic energies of, of the philosophy itself, and, and, and as I went deeper with the work itself, like an archeologist, I realized that, that the tomb had only been uh, in a way in, inquired into and, and it had a whole missing layer. And, and it, started, oh. it started to tell me, and, and this is why, you know, you asked about, am I still learning? Yes, this is, this is I would say a mentoring device, like yeah. a library is, that, that <clears throat> if the library is, is essentially, uh, um, uh, it is passive in that it is absolute resource, but it insists that to know something, we must engage. And because it right. is infinite resource, you could go to any particular book. So it begins to say, well, how are you going to put the story together, at least where you live? And that's what I like about the, the deeper overriding signature of this, because I think like a lot of us, I said, I really think the mythic question is, well, how do we live these things? You know, how do you integrate yeah. them into life? How do, you, how do you make them part of the community where you're not just studying these things in isolation, but they have a relevance? And I, and I feel that because I never had an agenda, and, and in a way I was dealing with, well, this might be crazy, but it, it was being driven almost in a Blakeian sense by a deeper uh, muse that, that is, is pushing me, pushing me, pushing me, as it did with the tarot, because I kept going deeper and things kept emerging. And I thought, I must be making this up. But then I'd research <laughs> and go deeper. And I wasn't making it up. It was having a conversation with me. Right. And I started thinking about acting, that if you're playing a role, the role begins to uh, activate within you and begins to have discussions within you. And as you work on it, it becomes more and more a realized and unique being. And this is what happened with the yeah. tarot. They became, and I almost feel that this is part of why I'm able to do what I'm able to do is because there is this deeper theatrical sense of be careful of what you think you need to believe because you'll be stuck in one book rather than being able to engage the library. That yeah. as in theater, don't judge the character you're playing or the judge the characters in the play, but rather navigate them. So that's really yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, beautiful, Lee. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, that's done then. <laughs> any any, any uh, other question? I, I... Lee, um, I, oh. I would love to um, ask you one simple question. But before that, I just want to say, through this whole journey that you've taken us on, I kept 
like un it, like all the blinders were coming off and coming off and coming off and I don't I don't even know what happened where I was going but I kept having this sensation of oh this is what it means to be human oh this is what it means to be mm, human beautiful. and it was watching you it was just the way that you do what you do and then watching every single uh image and story and and color and all of it so I, I mean I just I feel like I'm going to be I can't wait to see what my dreams do tonight because yeah. I feel yes. like now I get it I get it like I've never gotten it before in a certain way what it I means know. to be human you've just really given a, us that so thank you for that and you know I have a really simple question the, the apple seems to be such an essential original image for you and I saw it everywhere and you brought it into these beautiful um, stories you were telling and I would just love to hear you speak about the apple. Well, I, I have to, my, my father, who, who's, he, he passed in uh, 2003 at 90, was a wonderful painter. And he was working on apples, and of course, having a sense of humor, it was apples and oranges at times. Um, uh, but, but when the apple element emerged, which again, I was not expecting, uh, and, and I showed you on the sculpture where I touched her belly and there was the apple. Well, actually, there is a chair, which I, I'll, maybe Alex will bring, can you bring that chair over? The, the Eve chair? Oh, <laughs> the... Uh, yeah, ah, here's the apple. Um, <laughs> no, the yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because I'll show you on the Eve chair. What's fascinating is that that um, uh, first of all, I I I started to paint this uh, this chair, which is very old, and it it shouted at me saying, "You can't paint me. I'm an antique." <laughs> and it's interesting when you're working with the creative how. Uh, you really run into, well, when did this law uh, enter me? When did I, why do I have, that's not true. In other words, I had to, as it was saying, no, 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 I would, I, I would paint it. And what's, what's interesting is that I was asking about, because I'd seen a red with Sophia, I saw what looked like the apple and I just mused. I thought, well, what, what is this apple? What is this apple of Eve? And I walked over to this chair and we can see, I don't know, it's, it's, but there's a girl and a boy on the top. And there was an apple tree. So I started painting it. And then the apple, you can see, fell off the tree, but it fell into a type of al alchemical alembic of the blossom. So this became Eve's chair. And anybody whose bottom sits here is sitting on the apple. And that's why from that, like the bouncing ball, I started following the apple and it went up to her belly. And that's when it struck me ah we realize that when we turn an apple like this we have what the five-pointed star now we also have the toroidal shape if we think about this and everything even the first thing i showed you of uh, forbidden fruit the delicious knowledge of eve this gesture is this releasing through the top of the head the the the, the open eye like a circulatory system this movement of life and that's why the even the shape of the apple indicates the function of the apple in this narrative and what i love to point out between lilith and eve and christ all of these things really affirm what as i said what campbell jung and a lot of uh, different psychiatrists psychologists and uh, theorists are talking about which is we are composed of these qualities and to that i say i because as these energies started to appear it's more like a storyteller going, oh man, that's a much better story than I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. And the apple itself then becomes on this sort of, as it reappears, like the heron reappears, that every time it does, it becomes the indicator of not just life, but deliciousness. Things that we don't think about. We usually think about the form, we think about the structure, we study the implication and the statistics, but we forget about nourishment, about sweetness about that idea of of the fullness of things and i think that the apple uh like the feminine here uh and the intimacy here i think is trying to return us to the truth that we really can only experience uh with those we love which is intimacy that deliciousness of of that which is not to be shared with the world in a debate or anger uh, but actually um, since we are together let us take a bite out of this deliciousness. So it's a really beautiful symbol that I was not expecting to see. 
Well, thank you. I mean, as I was seeing it all through you, I was thinking of it through all the fairy tales and the biblical stories, and there's just so much. It's just, it really stands out. Um, and I just wanted to hear you talk about it. So thank you so much. And I, and I think just to, to add on, I think that's what was very uh, vivifying for me, that a lot of the biblical implications actually went back to the early times because I, I loved, I, I was fascinated with Gnosticism and early Christianity, and so I studied a great deal about those times. And, and, and it really goes back to that, that time uh, of a great excitement about these things and, and that there is something about the reemergence of this that is trying to put religion not in the institution or in the book or in the belief, but into the art, into the narrative, into the story. So again, here we live with Eve, we live with Lilith, we live with Christ and Buddha and Kuan Yin. We live with all of the different archetypes because they're essentially saying when you return home, you make room for all of us. It's not a matter of judgment, it's a matter of inclusion. So that's why the apple again is so powerful. Thank you. This was absolutely unbelievable. Um, I've never seen anybody walk and talk and engage in a mythic journey in this way. So <laughs> it was, as a psychologist, mind-blowing because <laughs> you have reached such a level of consciousness. I've never seen that before at, in this way. It's just amazing. Um, and the one question I have for you is, how do you use your, in the word that you used, your mentoring device, which I thought was so interesting. How do you use it in your life? What is fascinating for me is that a lot of this is actually, it downloads in tides, as if to say that one condition leads to another condition and that we are composing in a way, almost like a flower, a quality that can hold more and more of its own implications. And that's really what I've been feeling, this, this feeling of a growing um, uh, mentoring relationship that allows us, you know, if you think about, about a tuning fork, and I, I learned this at, at Tikal in the Palenque Rainforest, I said, I'm on an amplifier. This is nothing to do with religion. This has to do with the understanding of a type of fractal amplification. And I find this to be true here that, because if you think about the question is, um, to tell certain truths, we need the symbols to be appropriate. Otherwise, it's masking or missing the deeper component elements. So that's what becomes so interesting here is because the questions do, and you think about the mythic narrative talking about it, it's like, well, how do you walk it? How do you live it? How do you allow it to be a, a participation rather than just an observation? And that as this has grown, I, I sometimes think of it as a, as a crystal radio set. As the qualities have grown, as the, and, and it's going back to the other question about correspondences and about, about um, comparisons, that I started to realize that because this was uh, slowly emerging, that it wasn't emerging in a linear sense, it wasn't progressive, it was emerging in a type of greater ambient or spherical sense as if the living knowledge of the library itself created, creates here a type of alembic, a type of, uh, of condition that isn't insisting. This is what was interesting for me about the appearance of the watchers, because the watcher quality is, from direct experience of it, is it's the quality of sentience and consciousness that is, you'd say, our divine progenitors, meaning the, the qualities of sentience that we are composed of. But the genius behind the plan is that there was non-interference, meaning that if something is done for us, we believe that he or she who is doing it is the one who is able to, and we lose faith in the capacity that we are capable of these things. And that what became more and more apparent is that, that, uh, that the watchers create, like this room creates, the conditions where access and resource are, um, uh, you, you can access but you can't without the appropriate etiquette, meaning that, that it's not about shouting and ranting, it's about finding this other uh, place of stillness, which I also believe has to do with the creative spirit. You know, we've been taught to be artists, we've been taught that it's about art, about commerce, about making a living, 
And this actually goes back to a much more ancient thing about know the relationship with the creative spirit, once you trust it, begins to animate not part of reality, but all qualities of reality, like studying dreams become a symbolical feedback system. That's why uh, with a lot of things going on now, I, I look at things very archetypally. I even told people that when you spend uh, 17 years working on Trumps, which are what the tarot archetypes are called, and you've worked on one called the Trump Tower, you be, and, which is Mars, and he's orange, you start to, and it's all about setting things, uh, creating a fire that cannot be returned to as it once was, that it, it's a fire that, that insists upon transformation, it's very alchemical. We start to see once again that we're involved in a much greater symbolical theater that helps us take a breath and not like at the mirror, keep our nose pressed up against the mirror, thinking, why can't I do anything about it? And this is actually saying, you have no idea how powerful your thoughts are. But if you're doing this, your thoughts are about, why can't I get in? If you turn around and you return to this other story, then everything, and this is to end the question, which is a long answer, but, but it's that everything will then light up and mentor. I'm amazed at the conversations I have in here that, um, although I'm speaking out loud often <laughs> to the books, uh, the answers are uh, delightful. It, it, it's something, but I do think that um, I often think about this room that I had to do the 17 years of the tarot. I had to study hermeticism. I had to understand uh, esoteric philosophy. I had to, otherwise the conditions and the energies that would move through me here. Uh, I think a lot of people, it would have just uh, turned them into a puddle of, of goo. It, it, they're enormous energies, but I, I feel like they're, slowing down to a rate where we can honor them like a theater piece you know they've come to be with us and to stabilize and to give us permission to trust this imagination of ours oh thanks the chairman uh, I've been uh, there <laughs> um i've been there uh, quite a few times and i've enjoyed it uh, very much and uh, uh, every time I thought that, well, I, I think I'd, uh, did we lose? That's we, a big, uh oh, did we lose somebody? Uh, yeah, well, he he was going to say something, and, I think, uh, and if you don't have the words, describe it or define it in terms silent. of space, <laughs> <All right. laughs> in that it's a space. Sorry, I just I just crossed through the mirror. Did I miss anything? <laughs> Alex is back. Um, <laughs> it was 1600 when I left. Yeah. Yes. Well, actually, this this you know we go downstairs, and I'm convinced that that uh, actually there's a comedy in my head of of every time we leave the library, like we're always in the library, but we're always very philosophical and questioning, like yeah, well, in the 18th century we figured this out, and it's like so, well, what do we do now? What do we, you know, like artists always reexamining. Uh, well, if we did this in the 16th century, what's it like in the 17th century? How do we uh, uh, readdress the question. And I'm convinced that we keep going downstairs. And by the time we hit the second stair down, we forget everything so that we enter each world without knowing. And that when we finish, we reascend into the library. And when my dad died, I actually had the direct experience of his book of life being squeezed and the waters returning to the waters of life. And his book, his name was Joseph, his book of Joseph being put back onto the library shelf with this incredible sense of reverence from the voice saying, ah, but now it's been lived. And I thought that's what we don't understand is coming downstairs in these lives, in these bodies. We really don't know what's going on upstairs. We don't really understand that we're part of a great conversation and that there's a nobility in our willingness to continually return and to never know and always be forced to rediscover. And this is what I think and why I believe that our consciousness as the artist of consciousness, not an artist as a painter, but an artist of consciousness, realizes that the infinite potentiality of, of the possible and even the impossible need to be explored. Because in exploring these things, we not only honor them, but as we bring them to life, they transform who we think we are. And I think this is important because we have a living structure then that is essentially in this home saying that the journey of as above, so below, of thought's library, 
was as the black and white below in my tarot in the studio below, the black and white keys of the piano, the instrument, the father's room. I designed the room for my dad, so it's the father's room that the son designed. And there's the tarot archetypes, because the son says to the father, hey, dad, what's the difference between things? And the father says, listen, son, you're not leaving the house until you know the difference between the devil and the empress. So I'm going to take about 17 years with you, and then I'm going to send you out into the world so you'll be challenged this instrument of yours. But you'll come back because you'll always find a way back to the intimate or, or to that which does demand what the lower part of this house does, which I see as there are three levels. There's the below and then the midsection, which is my domestic plane, meaning my living room and bedrooms, our kitchen. This is important because it's saying that, that the ascension from below to above is not leaving. It's actually one place. It's one house with different rooms. So the questions upstairs are different than the questions downstairs. The questions in the imagination are different than the questions of the black and white of structure. And when we think about that, well, what's the other room? It's the living room. It's the bedroom. Well, those are the questions of domestic space. So those questions have certain truths and ways that they must be dealt with and answered. Then the room with black and white and structure, the instrument, they must be dealt with. You know, how do we navigate this thing? And then as we integrate, we rise up into the hieroglyph of the human soul, the picture book of the human soul, and it welcomes us. And it says, you have been struggling to venture toward this mirror of unique identity and self-reflection. How heroic. Because in this long journey of thousands of years, you would always feel abandoned, always feel that you were not enough, that there was somewhere to get to. And now that we've gotten there, and like with the pandemic, now that we can't leave home, it asks a different question. If you can't escape, if you can't get away, who do you think you are? And do you turn around and just go, oh, I'm just linoleum, I'm not golden, look at the floor, I'm just, I'm just ordinary. This alchemy says, no, you start with the ordinary and you trust the creative spirit, tell a story you can live with to those you love, and you'll become a gardener of the human soul. You'll be an architect of ideas that people can live within because you're not telling them how to live. You're reminding them to live. And that's why I love, again, coming full circle, that everything in this work, from the mandala to the tarot, are wheels. Wheels within wheels. And the question, and what I get here, is that we have been going across the ages over and over again until finally we could hold the below, the black and white, and the above, the mandala, the blossom and not leave home to do so, not being swept into Alpha Centauri or the Pleiades. It wouldn't make any sense to us. We've struggled forever to humanize cosmic knowledge. That's what this is saying. We wanted to slow it down so it would finally be human, and we'd no longer wish to simply return to a state of being we could no longer be, or places we could no longer get to. It's, it's, it's really, it's quite a lovely story if we could settle down and enjoy our humanity a bit and honor it. I see Zaman's back. Do you want to try again, Zaman? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I see there is a life after interruption. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I think. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know how it happened. I, I mean, I usually try, but I'm not that successful. But this time I was. <laughs> um, uh, I, I was talking about it in, in terms of space, and the reason I don't like the word space is that uh, it implies a kind of a, a void, an emptiness in it, whereas place implies more of fullness in it. And I think the space that you have created around yourself it has that. Uh, aspect of, of inviting people in and once you're mm. invited you're thinking like okay i'm going to see what uh, what's there and let me enjoy it and but but the point is that there is so much richness in it that it doesn't allow you to enjoy it to the fullest because before you have any chance the page turns on you and then there is another layer and another layer and it keeps going mm. and the other thing is that um if this is the human soul, um, and, and if you put the concept of the human soul next to, let's say, a painting, mm -hmm. we usually define a painting by a frame. And mm -hmm. the frame says, okay, this is what you're going to see no more. Mm -hmm. Whereas here, 
there is no frame. Yeah, yeah. Infinity is right there. And so if you paint, if the painting goes into the sofa, it goes into the sofa, it goes into the bench behind it and it keeps going, there is no end to it. And I've been upstairs, I've been yeah. almost in every room in your house. And, <laughs> and it's so wonderful that, that it's, it's not only expanding and, and flowing, but it is, it is expanding in a very meaningful way. There, the, the concept of a continuum is taken to its maximum. I think that's, uh, that, that's the beauty of it. The question I have, and I'm not sure if this is a question, but it's either a question or a comment, but uh, right. uh, I think in the, in the pre-biblical myth, um, the, the apple was actually a pomegranate. There you go. Yeah. Yes. And yes. It was the Which has the same in its meaning, essentially. Yeah, go on. And because the Europeans, uh, I, I, I don't uh, mean to be kind of insulting, but uh, because Europe was cold and there wasn't enough, they didn't have enough fruit or as much fruit as, say, the Middle East or India, most of the words uh, for those things were reduced to either uh, an apple, like in yeah. French, the, Pomme de terre, pomme d'amour, pomme de... I mean, everything is pom pom pom. Or you go into English and everything is berry, strawberry, mulberry, blueberry, you know, boysenberry. I mean, there are all these berries. And uh, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, pomme grenade or uh, the pomegranate uh, would have been the original. So I was thinking that in all of your paintings, whether by design or uh, some interesting uh, coincidence, the color of the apple is the color of the pomegranate. You know, it, 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 you know, it's very interesting you say that because I, and a lot of times when I do the tour, I said, I would often say this is an apple or if you prefer a pomegranate. So it's very, yeah, you're very right. I, I agree with that. I, I, I found that. But this is also an interesting question about the migration and you'd say cultural, but also the migration of symbols just as, as some, in a way, as, as a fascinating shading speaking going back to the idea of comparison but not as comparison uh of either or but actually as a type of larger uh, almost musical phrase between these different qualities because to me if you start to philosophically ponder a pomegranate uh, it it really does reveal uh the essential truths that the apple reveals but in a in a way as we know which i i think is really that sense of language itself where a language uh, reveals certain nuances that the other one simply cannot. So I love holding the two qualities uh, and not saying it's this or it's this, as much to say as, isn't it interesting that, that it has this uh, deep history of both? Well, and it was da Vinci's fetish fruit. He, he oh. hides them in all his paintings. That's, that's interesting, yeah. Did you know that about da Vinci and hiding his pomegranates? <laughs> Alex now told me that. <laughs> but the thing is that the uh, uh, the pomegranate, when when you uh, when you open it, you know you you open it in a certain way. You draw a parameter around it and lift the top. Then you, when you look at it from the top, the description that in some scriptural text is given to um, the Garden of Eden that it has these different mm -hmm. gates, and different parts. You see it in the pomegranate that. Mm -hmm. The different clusters, and then they are separated by, you know, uh, kind of partitioned, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe that is also uh, either symbolically or otherwise part of the image of uh, so what the description what the of New Garden. Jerusalem is, has, can be, has been likened to that section as well. Did you hear that? About New yeah, Jerusalem? Yeah. The description of New Jerusalem has been likened to the section of the pomegranate as well. Right, right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that actually what I, I, I love and realized is that that in the study of symbolism, because, you know, one studies it is that that the first principle of both the pomegranate and the apple are are that we are alive and that that the truth in life. I love the idea that you're talking about that, that it reveals in its very structure these different um, uh, implications in terms of the New Jerusalem, in terms of the, as you said, the gates. Because I, I really think that that's where nature, if you think about a quality that doesn't insist, and it, in, and, and, it, and it says, if you allow the poetic, the grace of things to emerge, you'll see how these things flow together. Or, but it has to be done 
for you, you're not ready because you're unwilling to participate. You want to be taught or you want to be uh, entertained or you want to be convinced as opposed to that listening with, a, with an inner ear that begins to ask that question, what may I learn from you? And this goes back to um, where you asked about earlier, where I was asked about, about the mentoring nature of, this, uh, of the hieroglyph, is that I really do feel that everything wishes, uh, in a way Rilke got at it, you know, that the thing itself transcends itself. It yearns to be realized by those of us in passing, and that when we animate it, it wants to reveal, it wants to reveal its, its inner secrets, and usually we're so busy defining it that, that we silence that. But I do feel like that's one of the great keys to sacred symbolism, and the truth that whenever we look at a lily or a, or a rose, or, that we're first dealing with, first notice that I am alive. That is my greatest point, that what this conversation will, uh, is going to be about is life, not not abstraction, not 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 mere mathematics, but the really the mathematics of nourishment. You know, I'd seen Voris uh, turn his microphone off, but I'd love to hear from him if he's still with us. I'm still with you, Will. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Um. um I want to make a comment and then ask you a question, Lee, if I can. Please, yes, please. Uh, but before we do, I'm glad that you know Zaman is very a very brave spirit, and um, and I'm glad you brought up the pomegranate because that makes me think Persephone, right? Yes. And so that takes it another way, and I like the way that both of you handled it with a kind of grace, which I really very much appreciate. Ah. Um, so in terms of my comment. Um, I'm very pleased that you brought up your interest in early Christianity and Gnosticism. Because for me, the reason why I'm moved by your, to call it a presentation, is not even, doesn't even get to what I think you did. Mm -hmm. You know, I've listened to a lot of brilliant talks, so that's not what it is for me. I listened to some insightful talks, that's not what it is for me. What I love about your, what you did, your performance is that it reminds me of Gnosticism hmm. and verse 70. Hmm. Where, and this is, and you're one of the few people that I've seen who actually embody this, where, and, and this verse changed my whole way of thinking about spirituality and religion and what it means to be alive. The verse is if you bring forth that which is within you, yeah. That which is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will destroy you. And it seems to me that you have brought forth all that which is within you. And I really appreciate that integration. That means a lot to me because you seem to embody that. Uh, so you make me think of that in it's kind of the best way because not only did you oh. bring forth what is productive about your own soul, but you also brought forth your wound, your woundedness. So that was very moving to me. So I very, very, very much appreciate it. Beautiful. Well, th well thank you. And I, I, I appreciate your appreciation because I really do feel that, that that's a beautiful quote. I've always felt that about, about that, the, that which is within us. Mm -hmm. It doesn't know what it is. It mm -hmm. doesn't know what it wants to be any more than something's yearning to be born. And I do feel like that difficult gestation, the realization that there's not a logical way but but a, a willingness to oftentimes follow and 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 insist that that one not succumb to the anguish but actually uh utilize that as an even deeper spur to keep going almost that that there's a type of unique strength in the human heart i'm convinced that that begins to recognize that that as much as one would hope that these things would matter to the world that it really doesn't and therefore it becomes tenfold important that as an individual you think well then if it matters to me then it must truly matter and i feel like that's why i've never uh, you know I, I almost feel like in another life i'll i'll, I'll, I'll rest more because I, i've been really just driven to uh, find a way 
to give voice to things that, that I, and I remember, you know, because I, I was plunged into my unconscious as a 14 year old, 15 year old, and, and I had lucid dreams, out of body experiences, nightmares, uh, and hypnagogic paralysis, which I still have at times. And, and this, because of this, I, I didn't go the, I, 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 as I put it, I didn't need hallucinogens. I needed to find Carla, <laughs> my wife. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was dealing with, well, what do you do when all of these uh, qualities where, you know, the old joke, I know I'm not mad, I'm not, not crazy, but if I don't find a way to talk about these things or find a language for them, uh, they will make no sense to anyone else. And what I love about the art is because art isn't about the artist. This is what I feel. It's almost like you said about the optimism or the feeling it gives you. Is that, I, you know, it's like a Beatles song. What I love is that, that something very human is brought forth in the passion of the individual that says, I wish this would matter to you, but it doesn't need to because it matters to me. So if I honor it, if I cultivate it, like this is my victory garden, if I make this valuable, then I'm, I'm imbuing it with, with values that to me are uh, eternal, meaning that, that what you love will grow, also what you hate will grow. So there really is one question upon us, what will you grow? And, and I think that the sense of, uh, and I love this idea of, of the Gnostic relationship, because I do feel that uh, oftentimes that we have forgotten the celebration, the dance, and that when we read ancient texts and early Christianity and about the Essenes and about uh, Jewish mysticism, all these things, it's not meant to be a gauge of which was right or wrong, but this, this immersion into the truth that Drink deeply, live vibrantly, be free. Don't compare. Live now and here. And that to me is what brings us again in the theatrical sense onto stage together, no longer just sitting and critiquing, but participating. And what I love sort of bringing this all the way around is that what I love for me is that when I fell on my knees on 9-11, I had no idea this would happen. I had no idea that, uh, you can't see it, but if you have chroma depth glasses, if you put on 3D glasses here, this becomes multidimensional. A fixed, multidimensional reality that is not doing anything for us, but the glasses are saying, if you look at me one way, put the glasses on, look at me again, there is more than one way to see. And, and this is part of that sense also, I believe, that we've studied all the books, we've studied all the doctrines, we've compared, and now it's that sense, as I showed you in the beginning of the chalice of the grail, how do we actually embrace it and say, at least here, you're invited. And that's what our home, Carl and I opened our home, and we've had, as, as Dana was saying, um, uh, for many, many years, not just discussion groups, we've also had presentations, everything from the sound baths to the Dalai Lama's monks chanting to, to uh, Alex's documentaries. To, so it's been, it's been a very marvelous energy here of where people like yourself, like all of us, gather and have said over the years at Olandar, the name of my home, at least here, let these things matter. And this is Shumash land, the sacred Shumash land, who lived here for 10,000, still do a few, uh, but for 10,000 years without a word for war. And as the white guy on the Shumash land, mm -hmm. I had to look at myself honestly and say, all right, how do you make sense of this? A lot of blood is in the soil. Mm -hmm. And I started to think of the ego reaching the Pacific Ocean, this white boy, going across, taking everything, saying, what are you doing with my property? Meaning taking religions, taking people, taking lands, a voracious appetite for more. I need more, I need more, I need more until we reach the coast here. There's no further to go. And the question then shifts, what do I do with all of the darkness that essentially we've, we've gone through? And it's, it is, it's saying that on this sacred land where there's no further to go, the ancestors stand with you. And they ask you not to fight over the books or those conditions that got you here, but to put them lovingly back on the shelf, to step back as we do in the hieroglyph, and see that all of the different parts were essential to the greater story and question of what does it mean to be human? And that as we do not seek to go further, but actually like a tree,
to go deeper into our roots, and this is why this is again the domestic key and the ancestral key, is the ancients that we are rise up through us and begin to honor the fact that, that only by reaching the point on our own, where we are exhausted by the mirror of self-reflection and the sense that I can't get anywhere, I finally see myself, but I don't like that. What do I do? It says, mm -hmm. turn around, you're home. Mm -hmm. And the Shumash here say, there is no guilt, there is honor. So honor this earth. We were the caretakers and we love this land. You express your truth by loving this land, and I do. And, and I, I've always felt, I grew up two miles from here, so I, I feel, uh, again, almost like a very uh, part of the soil itself here. And it wants to, it wants to say, honor me. That's what the fire said. It said, people have forgotten what they love. There's a drought in the human heart, knowing what they hate, judging their neighbors, forgetting about community. And the fire said, I will bring everyone to their knees. This is a time of apocalypse and judgment, meaning that you are not to condemn your neighbor, but to think of community, to honor the fact that to understand who we are, all the characters are essential. But the key to who we are is that where we live and how we compose the story allows us to either live with it or be undone by it. And this is why I think the art element is so important and that we as creative beings are emerging because we're not trying to convince each other. We're trying to say, yes, yes, there's a way to approach these things that says it's up to you but the grail taught. You're not given anything, and anything you seek to know, you become worthy of it, and it will reveal its secrets. And if you are not willing to love what you seek to know, do not expect any doors to open. Lee, you have the most graceful way of bringing something full circle. I'm reminded of the phrase that you make something and then the thing that you make makes you. Yes. Whether it's language or art or relationships, whatever we pour our heart and soul into comes back tenfold. Absolutely. And, it, and it is, it's just beautiful that you would have agreed to come and join the Myth Salon. Yeah, wouldn't miss I think it. <laughs> what I would like to do is throw out an invitation to you and to people that once we are back at a place where we can gather, that we would congregate and hold a myth salon out at Olander. Yes, that that's a, that's a definite do. Yes, and absolutely. You know, I yes. just really feel I am so grateful. Um, I'm just. I'm, I'm filled with gratitude. I, I just, I, I feel grateful. Huh. On that note, what I would like I to do is go out the way that we come in with a moment of silence. Hmm. So join me, please. Lee, Alex, and especially, yeah, Alex, I just, I can't say enough about the quality of what you brought into and when we talked about doing this. I don't think it's ever been done. Mm -mm. I, 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 you are a wizard. No, 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 it's, tell it's people. something that the iPhone 12 can do. And I, I don't, I think, we did it. I, I don't you're, know. If, you're, I've never heard of it. You're saying it was the phone. I would say that it's Alex. <laughs> I, I don't think I, I could have. I have an iPhone 11, which can do the same thing. I couldn't have done that. That was just a masterful performance on both of your parts and two amazingly talented people. And so on behalf of yeah, thanks. the Miss Salon and Will and Zaman and Voris and Dennis and Taria coming all the way from North Carolina. I mean, you know, 
she's staying up way past her bed. Wow. <laughs> you know, so thank you. Thank you so oh. much. And we'll talk soon. Welcome everybody and have yeah. a great evening and we'll see you all at all in dark. Thank you. We'll see Good. you all soon. All right. Good. Bless Beautiful. You. Thank you. Bye thank you, Dana. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, what an evening. Oh, oh that's great. Uh, all right.